Math 31, let's take a look at radical equations. So a radical equation, a lot like a rational equation, it's just that this time we have radical expressions in our equation. So here's a radical equation, here's a radical equation, here's a radical equation. This is probably the simplest version. You only have the one radical. This, when we go to solve one of these, this is a little bit more convoluted to solve because there's two radicals. It's gonna take twice as long to do this type of problem as this one. All right, and then this isn't too terrible because you have two radicals of the same index. These are both cube roots and you have one on either side. So solving that type of equation, not too bad. All right, and this one isn't too bad and this one's gonna take a little bit of work. Okay, so as we start to go through this, you're gonna hear me say something like isolate the radical before you do anything else. And this technique of isolating the radical, we're gonna see that play out when we solve exponential equations, when we solve logarithmic equations, and really we could have even done it on example one when we were solving equations with rational exponents. For, for radical equations, wherever the radical is, isolate it on one side of the equation, all right? And when I say isolate it, and let me make sure we have this written somewhere, isolate the radical. That means that right now, my radical is on the left side of a, the equation, but it's not alone. It's got this x with it. And if I wanna get it all by itself on a side of the equation, I think the simplest way is actually to move it to the right. I could subtract the x from both sides, but I like positive coefficients, so I'm going to add the square root of 4x plus 12 to both sides. These become like terms, so they're gonna cancel out. So that leaves me with a the equation x equals the square root of 4x plus 12. And you'll take note now that my radical is isolated. All right, now you can rewrite this as a rational expo exponent if you want. You can say this, if you, let me just talk about what I mean. You can rewrite this as 4x plus 12 to the 1 half if you want, and use that reciprocal idea that we talked about in example one. You don't have to do that. I just wanna kind of connect those ideas. But what I'll do is I'll just leave it in radical form here and say, hey, I'm gonna square both sides, okay? Now, square roots and squares, those are inverse operations, so I'm just gonna get 4x plus 12 on the right side and I get x squared on the, right, uh, on the left side. And you can see now I have a quadratic equation. And we talked for a little bit in, in section 2.5 about how you solve equations that are quadratic. You've got factoring, completing the square or using the quadratic formula, right? So let me just take note here, right? You can factor, you can complete the square, or you can use the quadratic formula. All right, it's your call. I had mentioned before, personally, I like factoring the best. If I can, I feel like it's the shortest or the, the least work I gotta do. And if I can factor, I'm gonna do it. And then if I can't factor, I, I go over the quadratic formula. But as we talked about in section 2.5, completing the square and the quadratic formula always work. You'll always get a solution. Factoring may or may not work. I'm gonna try and factor. If I take a look at this, I have my quadratic equation. I need to set it equal to zero. Because again, with factoring and quadratic formula, you set it equal to zero, or you set your equation equal to zero. When you complete the square, you set your equation equal to your constant, meaning I would have left the 12 over here and moved the 4x to the left. I'm gonna set the whole thing to zero. So I'm gonna say x squared minus 4x minus 12 is equal to zero. And this one, especially because the lead coefficient is one, it's not too terrible to solve. What are numbers that multiply to 12 but add up to negative four? Well, x minus six and x plus two, right? And then I could use the zero product property. And if two terms multiply to zero, then at least one of them was zero. And let me scoot this up just a little bit so we can see my solution here. All right, so either x minus six was equal to zero or x plus two is equal to zero. So I get x equals six or negative two. All right, so those are going to be my two solutions. And what typically happens when we're solving radical equations is we, we tend to get an extraneous solution. So an extra solution that exists, at least algebraically, once you work through it, but doesn't actually fit into the original problem. So let me, let me show you what I mean by this. All right, I'm gonna erase that. Okay, what this means is when you get your two answers at the end, it's very possible one of them doesn't actually work. So we're going to check these answers. So let me put my scratch work here 
and let's check these answers, okay? Let's check x equals 6. I'm going to check it against my original equation. So I want to see, is it true that 6 minus the square root of 4 times 6 plus 12 is equal to 0? I'm going to put a question mark over that equal sign for right now until I know one way or the other. All right, so let's try this. 4 times 6 is 24. 24 plus 12 is 36. So I have 6 minus the square root of 36. Is that equal to 0? Well, is 6 minus 6 equal to 0? It sure is. 0 is equal to 0. That answer checks out. Great. Fantastic. I want us to check the other one now in case negative 2 is extraneous. Let's see. All right, so let's see if this one works. I'm going to do negative 2 minus the square root of 4 times negative 2 plus 12 is equal to 0. All right, so let's see what we have. We have negative 2 minus the square root. All right, 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 12 is 4. Ooh, my radical is a little too long. Let me erase it. All right, is negative 2 minus 2 equal to 0? No, it's not, right? So this we call an extraneous solution. We get that extraneous solution because we ultimately squared both sides and then we solved that quadratic equation, which will always give us these two answers. But in squaring both sides, you, you pop up an extra answer most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time you do. So it has to do with the fact that we squared both sides and then we solved the quadratic equation, which will always give you two answers, even though it's quite possible only one of them was your solution. So for this problem, the only answer that we really should have is x equaling 6. All right. So taking a look at our work, right? we isolated the radical. That was the first thing we needed to do. And then we solved that equation by squaring both sides. And when you square both sides, and then ultimately, in a way, you square root those numbers, you're going to introduce two solutions. And typically, only one of them works. It's possible both of them work. It's possible one of them works. And it's possible neither of them works. But typically, one of them works. That's the most common option. So when you get your answers, don't forget to check them at the end. That's probably the most common mistake I see is students will work through their answers and they're like super pumped. They're like, yeah, I got it, sold. And then they forget to check the answers and eliminate one or potentially one. All right, so when we flip to the next page, we're gonna solve a much more convoluted radical equation. It's going to have two radicals in it and it's gonna require more than double the work. Yay, all right, I'll see you in a few, bye.